it's uh, a shocking uh, and seismic event in American jurisprudential history. Two whole generations of women have grown up with an expectation of this as one of their fundamental rights. It's a seismic event, and it's an event that really uh, slaps in the face a quite developed sense of what the liberty of Americans is to, you know, basically everybody, you you know, I I am the generation that I I was four years old when, when Roe came down. Uh, I do not remember a world without Roe and the majority of Americans Uh, are in that position. And so there's something uh, very dramatic, uh, I I think very upsetting, about the blithe manner in which the court uh, uh, treats, again, irrespective of whatever you think of the original decision, treats the expectations that have grown up around it as it has has become part of the fabric of American law. Roe has been controversial since the day it came down. Whether you believe Alito was right that in 1973, this was not a deeply rooted part of the conception of liberty of Americans, I I think it's very hard to argue that it isn't today. Normally, we think of constitutional rights as things that are written in the Constitution, or one step removed from that, things that are strongly implied by things that are written in the Constitution. And in Roe, uh, the court derived uh, the right to abortion from a from a right that itself was not articulated, which is the right to a certain degree of privacy, particularly in the sexual context. And so Roe was prestiged uh, by the Griswold decision, which upheld uh, the uh, right to contraception within the context of a marriage. And then by the uh, lesser known Eisenstadt decision, uh, which extended that to the use of contraception outside of a marriage. But remember, neither the right to privacy as such nor the right to use contraception is articulated in the Constitution. And so there has always been a conservative or originalist or you might say textual concern about Roe that it was very attenuated from the actual text of the Constitution. That complaint has followed Roe for 50 years. This is one of the fundamental arguments that separates the people who look at this from the point of view of women's rights and the people who look at this from the point of view of the authority of the state to protect an unborn fetus, right? So if you start with the premise the fetus is a human life, the state has an interest in protecting human life, Uh, then you look at this and you say, well, uh, and this, I think this argument infuses the Alito opinion. Uh, You know, we don't let the, you know, states are allowed to ban murder and we don't say, well, that's curtailing the right of the murderer. Um, And, you know, here, you know, human beings are built differently from one another. Men don't do pregnancy and women do. And so this this is just a fetal life protection that a state is entitled to do. And there's no affirmative right to uh, not be regulated by that. Right. That's the sort of animating theory of, of the majority opinion. Now, the dissent starts from a completely different place, which is, hey, if you restrict the right of abortion, you're engaged in a regulation of all sorts of human behavior that only affects women and doesn't affect men, and that therefore reduces the status, the citizenship, the rights of women in a fashion that is objectionable. So this is I think this is the issue that fundamentally divides pro-choice people from pro-life people is just, you know, are you looking at this from the point of view of the state and its ability to protect the fetus, which you've defined as human life, which you view as human life, 
Or do you look at it from the point of view of the woman and whether you can compel her to carry a pregnancy, compel her to give birth, compel her to do things that you could never compel a man to do, to which the other side would say, yeah, but that's not because you couldn't compel a man to if they could get pregnant. They just, you, you're, you're describing innate biological differences there. There's a division among conservatives as to whether the federal government could ban an abortion. And for example, Justice Scalia always said he did not believe it was a federal matter. He didn't believe in that it was uh, that the federal government had the authority to protect it or to ban it. And I think there are other conservatives who are more enthusiastic about uh, the uh, the power, using the power of the federal government to restrict it. And you see that in the partial birth abortion ban. Uh, you see that in a certain measure of enthusiasm in Congress all the time for measures that will restrict abortion. So I certainly expect uh, conservative legislators to try. Um, I, uh, I do think... Uh, you know, Justice Kavanaugh is laying down a marker here that, you know, I'm not interested in, I'm interested in returning this to the states and not having the federal government have a national policy on this. A federal ban would have to survive challenge under the Commerce Clause. And um, it is not clear to me that some of the conservatives would be interested in that. Uh, Clarence Thomas has specifically flagged that question as something he's got anxieties about. I think as an initial matter, it's very hard to imagine the Senate uh, passing a national ban. There, there are just more pro-life, sen- uh, pro, pro-choice senators than that. Um, I think if there were a national ban, it would really divide conservatives jurisprudentially. Um, and there's a, a, a major strain of conservative thought that it, uh, a national abortion ban would, would violate the Commerce Clause. Generally speaking, there is a pretty robust federal right to travel interstate. But look, in, among a bunch of European countries, uh, Ireland, for example, had an extraterritorial ban on Irish citizens getting abortions, and they would, you know, they would frequently go to London for abortions, and it was illegal. Uh, and Ireland would periodically prosecute people for leaving the country to get abortions. The FDA issue is a very, very interesting one, and I think it's going to provoke a lot of litigation very quickly. So, as a general matter, federal. Uh, law governs the availability of of the regulation of drugs and the approval of drugs. And this is an approved drug that is safe and efficacious in some uses. On the other hand, the practice of medicine is regulated at the state level. It'll be interesting to see whether states, you know, tr- try and are able to prevent the availability, the sale of the drug. But what I think they can certainly do is prevent the prescription or regulate doctor's ability to prescribe the drug. And so I think you're going to end up with a very interesting clash of federal and state authorities uh, just in the regulatory environment. The other thing that you're going to see is uh, certain states are very likely to try to regulate the mobility of women in order to get abortions. And that's going to be a, I think that's an area where uh, they're very unlikely to succeed, um, but I think it'll be a particularly hot, uh, hotly contested area uh, legislatively, particularly in certain areas of the South and Midwest. We actually ran a piece on Lawfare recently about how different the surveillance environment is from now now versus 1973. And so if you imagine, imagine a woman in a state that criminalizes abortion uh, who has a miscarriage relatively late in pregnancy, um, and one of her neighbors doesn't believe it was a miscarriage, believes it was an induced abortion of some kind. So reports her local police department decides to investigate Think about how much relevant data there is on her phone. She may have a period tracking app. She may have her calendar where she may have scheduled 
whatever appointment she's suspected of having had. She may have all the prescriptions uh, that she took, including, say, mifepristone, right? Or um, and so you could you, you could really imagine a degree of intrusiveness in these in just the investigative activities surrounding these cases that is unlike anything that would have happened in 1973. I suspect Griswold is is probably safe. I'm less confident about Obergefell and um, and Lawrence v. Texas, although I, uh, which is uh, uh, same sex sexual activity. Although I suspect uh, those are probably the, the I, I suspect the court probably uh, wouldn't wouldn't want to revisit Lawrence v. Texas. That said, the mechanism by which it would come up, I, I do think Obergefell is in some jeopardy. And the mechanism by which it would come up is that some state would pass a gay marriage ban and somebody would challenge it and the Supreme Court would uh, either have to hear it or would uh, defer to a lower court until there was some reason why the Supreme Court had to confront the question. And then you, and then and only then you will learn the answer to the question of whether there are five votes to overturn Obergefell as well as Roe. Loving has a different origin, um, which is the line of, uh, racial equal protection cases, there are zero votes on the Supreme Court for the idea that the state can actively, in a, in a de jure fashion, discriminate against people on the basis of race. Um, and there are a million questions about what remedial steps states can take, like affirmative action, like, you know, uh, voting rights intervention to remediate discrimination. But the idea that the state, and there's also dispute about, for example, what can states do that might have disparate impact on minority groups, right? The justices disagree about all those sorts of things. They do not disagree about if the if the gov legislature of the state of the Commonwealth of Virginia says black people can't marry white people. There, I don't think there's one vote on the Supreme Court for the idea that that's okay. Here I'm stepping out of my role as an analyst. I will just say I am a pro-choice person who wants people to have abortion access when they need abortion access. I think people need to think about it not in the immediate term in the in the in the context of the Constitution, because the Supreme Court has spoken and there's very little you can do about that. There's a state-to-state -state battle that needs to happen that. Uh, involves the mobilization of very large numbers of people not to talk to Washington, but to talk to their state capitals and to elect people to their state legislatures who are going to protect abortion rights in their states as a legislative matter. Um, that process, I think, is going to take five to seven years of just turmoil at the state level you have to go through a few election cycles to have it stabilized. And then you're going to know, do we have a problem here that affects 30% of the women in the country? Do we have a problem here that affects 70% of the women in the country? Are there, what's, what's, the, what's the policy problem at that point when, when that dust settles that we really need to address? And I think... I'm not sure about this. I think the answer is that, you know, we're going to have a pretty good environment on the coasts and in certain liberal islands. And we're going to have a very ugly situation in large swaths of the center of the country. And, but I don't know that. And I wouldn't be wholly surprised if a whole lot of otherwise conservative women had a are you fucking kidding me reaction to this? And that it ended, ended up creating a bit of a, you know, sagebrush rebellion in a, in a keep your hands off my body kind of fashion. So I don't know what direction it's likely to go. And I don't trust anybody who claims to. I do think 
the nature of the constitutional regime is that you got to fight it out at the state level because that's, you know, at the end of the day, we don't, as Robert Jackson said about the Supreme Court, it's not final because it's infallible. It's infallible because it's final. And this decision is unfortunately final for now. And uh, it will take a number of Supreme Court opinions, a number of Supreme Court nominations from liberal presidents before it ceases to be final again. And what this opinion says is states get to do what they want in this area. So I think the answer is we have to fight it at the states.